In my hands, I have a copy of last year's JEE Advance. And I think that the sheer volume of this stack of papers already tells its own story. JEE Advanced is notorious for being one of the most difficult exams in the world. Students study for years before taking this exam because a high score will increase their chances of getting into a good university. The exam was first conducted in 1961 as an entrance examination for the Indian Institute of Technology as a way to make better engineers. However, it has been said that the exam is made to reject students rather than select them. The exam consists of two papers that the students are given three hours each to solve with a break in between. And the questions cover the topics of mathematics, physics and chemistry. So in this video, I want to give you an overview of the kind of questions that they ask in this exam. And I also want to walk you through the solutions of the hardest question, which only 0.7% of students got right. So if we just briefly glance through the mathematics part of the first paper, we see that we start off with a calculus question, the second question is a question on probability, then we have some trigonometry. In section two, we start dealing with a few questions on set theory, which I thought was quite interesting. As we move on further, there are more calculus questions and even a few questions on matrices, which I thought was quite interesting because I did learn about matrices in high school, but I think I was also part of some special advanced class. It's really not general knowledge of a high school student from my country. So I was quite impressed that this is what they expect from teenagers taking this exam. So before getting into one of the hardest questions on this exam, I was thinking that we could work out one of the easier ones, which is question one. Imagine if question one had been the most difficult one, that would have been terrible. But basically, if you sat down for the JEE Advanced last year, this is the first question of the mathematics part that you would have to solve. Question one is the following. Let f of x be a continuously differentiable function on the interval of zero to infinity, such that f of one is equal to two. And let the limit of this expression as t goes to x be equal to one for each x greater than zero. Then for all x greater than zero, f of x is equal to, and we are given four different expressions, and our task is to determine which of these expressions corresponds to f of x. So if we just look at this expression, and we take the limit t going to x, we see that we just get zero divided by zero, which is undefined and doesn't help us. So the trick that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, but basically you take the limit of the derivative of the numerator over the derivative of the denominator which in this case is just 10 times t to the power of 9 f of x minus x to the power of 10 f prime of t over 9 t to the power of 8 equal to 1. So we can take the limit of this new expression and rearrange some terms. And then I also want to define f of x as being equal to y and f prime of x as being dy dx. And we get the expression dy dx minus 10 over x times y is equal to minus 9 x squared. And this kind of equation is well known. And to solve this differential equation, you can use a well known trick, which is the integrating factor. So in our case, we're going to define minus 10 over x as being our p of x and minus 9 over x squared as being our q of x. And our integrating factor is just this exponential, which we can work out as being 1 over x to the power of 10. Now, if we multiply both sides of this equation with the integrating factor, we see that the left-hand side is just the integral of the derivative of y times i. So since we know that our i is 1 over x to the power of 10, we can plug this in and work out the integral, and we get that y over x to the power of 10 is the integral of minus 9 over x to the power of 12, which we can work out as being 9 over 11 times x to the power of 11 plus some integrating constant c. We can work out that the final expression for y is 9 over 11 times x plus c times x to the power of 10. And also, since we were given at the start of this question that f of 1 is equal to 2, we can plug this in to work out what our integrating constant c is. And we find that c is equal to 13 over 11, which gives us that the final expression for y is 9 over 11x plus 13 over 11x to the power of 10, which means that the answer to question 1 is b. So that wasn't too bad, but I can understand under time constraint and pressure, this can still be quite tricky to work out. So I would now like to walk you through what is arguably the hardest problem on this exam that only 0.7% of students were able to get right. And the problem is the following. Let R3 denote the three-dimensional space. Take two points P and Q 
Let dist x, y denote the distance between the two points x and y in R3. Let s be the set of points in R3 such that the distance between x and p squared minus the distance between x and q squared is equal to 50. Let t be the set of points y in R3 such that the distance between y and q squared minus the distance between y and p squared is also equal to 50. And we're giving a list of four statements and our task is to determine which of these statements are true, if any. So the way that you should solve this is that you should first try to work out what the equations for s and t are. So if we start with s, we know that there are some points x that satisfy this relationship. So if we take some random point x in s that we can note with coordinates a, b, c, then we can easily work out the distance between x and p and the distance between x and q. So we end up with this following expression and we see that these two middle terms cancel each other. All of the squares of a and c also cancel each other and we can sum up the remaining terms and we end up with 6a plus 8c minus 55 is equal to 50, meaning that we now have an equation for s, which is 6x plus 8z is equal to 105. So we can do a similar thing for t, where we take some random point y that we denote with coordinates alpha, beta, gamma, and we write down the difference between the distance squared between y and q and the distance squared between y and p. So as we saw previously, once again, these middle terms cancelled, all the squares of alpha and gamma also cancel, and we are left with minus 6 alpha minus 6 gamma plus 55 is again equal to 50. So we have obtained the equation for t, which is 6x plus 8z is equal to 5. So if we compare the equations for s and t, we notice something interesting, which is that s and t are two planes and they both have the same normal vector 6x plus 8z which means that they are two parallel planes and this makes our lives a lot easier because if we now go back to the statements we see that statement a there is a triangle whose area is one we know that since s is just some two-dimensional surface we can easily just draw some random triangle which has an area of one and all of whose vertices are in s Thus, we know that A is true. Similarly, for B, there are two distinct points L and M in T, such that each point on a line segment L and M is also in T. Once again, we know that T is just some 2D plane, so we can easily take some point L, some point M, and we draw a line between them, and we know that this line segment LM is also going to be in T. So we know that B is also true. And then for the statement C, there are infinitely many rectangles of perimeter 48, two of whose vertices are from S and the other two vertices are from T. So as I said previously, S and T are two parallel planes with the same normal vector, so it's quite easy to work out the distance between them because you just take the absolute difference between these two constant terms 105 minus 5 over the length of this normal vector, which is just the square root of 6 to the power of 2 plus 8 to the power of 2. So we know that the distance between these two planes is 10, which means that we can quite easily think of a lot of different rectangles between these planes. Two vertices are from S and the other two vertices are from T, which will have a perimeter of 48. So we know that C is true. Similarly, for statement D, there is a square of perimeter 48. Two of whose vertices are from S and the other two vertices are from T. This is very similar to statement C, and we know that since the distance between S and T is just 10, we can quite easily tilt this square, which has two vertices in S, two vertices in T, and sides of length 12, such that the perimeter is 48. So D is also true, meaning that the answer to question 7 is that all of the four statements listed were true. So I now only showed you two questions of the mathematics part of the first exam, but keep in mind that the mathematics part has 17 questions in total, and there is also the physics and chemistry section, which have the same amount of questions. And the students are only given three hours to do all of these three parts, meaning that they probably only have around one hour to do the 17 questions on the mathematics part. So I am really impressed by all of the teenagers that are taking this exam. I don't think we have a similar kind of examination with this difficulty in my own country. So looking through this humbled me a little bit. So I only had time to go through some of the mathematics questions in this video, but in a future video I would like to go through the physics section, which is my own field of study. So I will see you if you decide to watch that part as well. Bye!